good evening, everyone. I'm Erica Warren, Associate Curator of Textiles here at the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, and I want to welcome you to this evening's virtual program, an artist talk with Tanika Johnson and Visa Butler on the occasion of the exhibition Visa Butler Portraits. We'd like to thank Allstate for their support and for their lead corporate support of the exhibition. We'd also like to thank the Kaviga Family Trust for their generous support, as well as the Joyce Foundation and Daryl and Nicole Hackett. And finally, I'd like to recognize the Frank J. Mooney Memorial Fund for making this program possible. We are so glad to have you joining us virtually. And while we wish that we could welcome you in person, we hope that the digital format can offer a chance to stay connected to the Art Institute from home or wherever you are. We'll begin with a brief review of some of the features we'll be using today. This program will be shared in presentation mode, so we have turned off video and microphones for attendees. For optimal viewing, please select full screen mode under the view options in the top right corner of your screen. Throughout the presentation, you're invited to share questions through the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. We look forward to answering some of those questions at the end of the presentation. Closed captions are available and can be turned on via the controls at the bottom of the screen as well. If you encounter any technical difficulties during the program, again, please let us know in the Q&A and we will do our best to assist you. The program is being recorded, so if you'd like to revisit it in the future, you'll be welcome to do so. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers, artists Visa Butler and Tanika Johnson. Visa Butler's portrait quilts vividly capture personal and historical narratives of Black life. Using textiles, a traditionally marginalized medium, she presents an expansive view of history through their engagement with themes such as family, community, migration, the promise of youth, and artistic and intellectual legacies. Tanika Johnson is an artist and photographer from Chicago's Southside Englewood neighborhood. Her multimedia project titled Folded Map has transformed into an advocacy and policy influencing tool that invites audiences to open a dialogue and question how we are all socially impacted by racial and institutional conditions that segregate the city. Thank you both so much for being here. Uh, to begin, we want to share just a few installation images of the exhibition to provide everyone uh, joining us this evening with a sense of this project. Um, the exhibition is on the second floor of the Art Institute uh, at the top of the Women's Board Grand Staircase, as you can see here, and in conversation with the sculpture on the landing, Richard Hunt's Hero Construction from 1958. Hunt, a Chicago-based sculptor, also has an exhibition installed at the museum on the Bloom Family Terrace and in the Modern and Contemporary Galleries. The Safety Patrol, the Art Institute's recent acquisition, welcomes visitors into the first gallery of the exhibition and introduces the theme of the promise of youth. Also included in this gallery is Romare Bearden's collage, The Return of Odysseus, seen here on the left, excuse me, on the right. <laughs> Made of cut paper on board, it further highlights the collage-like aspects of Butler's work. The second gallery of the exhibition considers the themes of family and migration. We are very proud to debut Butler's recent work, The Warmth of Other Sons, made for the installation here in Chicago. A portrait of a family newly arrived in the city after the Great Migration, the title of the work references Isabel Wilkerson's 2010 book of nearly the same name. The works in the neighboring gallery consider Butler's artistic genealogy and situate her work alongside her predecessors, such as Gordon Parks, Nelson Stevens, and Barbara Jones Hogu. Uh, Butler's work, I Am Not Your Negro at Center, is framed on the left by Nelson Stevens' painting Toward Identity and on the right by four photographs by Gordon Parks. 
The last gallery of the exhibition includes work that show the myriad ways in which Butler calls um, attention to her subjects and tells their stories, bringing to life small details that suggest the love, resilience, and energy of those she portrays. As her work often begins with a photo or a selection of photographs, it seemed only right to include the works you see here, particularly the two facing one another, as these are based on two iconic Chicago images, photographs taken by Russell Lee in Bronzeville in 1941. And with that brief overview, I want to turn now to Bisa and Tanika. And we are so honored and delighted that they are joining us this evening. Bisa, if you can hear me, I was going to ask you if you could share a bit about your experiences growing up, as well as some insights into your undergraduate studies and speak sure. about how these inform and shape your work today. Sure, um, can you see me? Now, yes, I can now. I couldn't before okay. and I was worried. I apologize everyone, thank you for your patience. Sure, no problem. Um, I, when I think about growing up, um, I came from a very middle-class African-American family from New Jersey. And I always feel like I had really big shoes to fill. Um, I wanted to start this talk with sharing an image of my own grandfather, just to give an idea of, of how much I, I always had these influences in my life that started before me. And sometimes people tell me, you know, Bisa, you're doing a lot of big things or good things. But honestly, in my opinion, I almost feel like it's not enough. And so right here, I'm showing a picture of my grandmother and my grandfather. And that's where I'd like to start because these two young people were both graduates of Xavier University, historically black college in Louisiana, in New Orleans to be exact. And they went off my grandfather got a, a chance to study for his PhD in Belgium. And at that time in the United States, you're talking late 1930s, like 1938, it was very difficult for black people to get professional degrees in this country. Um, education was segregated, their, their opportunities were segregated, and especially because they were down in Louisiana, which was definitely a segregated state, a Jim Crow state. They went over to Belgium together and he had to learn, well, he knew French, but he knew more of the Louisiana style of French. He had to learn uh, the French that was speaking over in Belgium. And then World War II began and all of a sudden women and children had to be evacuated. And my grandmother and my aunt were sent home on a ship and were were basically the only black people on the ship. And it's interesting, I have my grandmother's notes from, from that event. And so when I work, I'm thinking about those who came ahead of me. Um, and I'd like to share a little bit of my undergrad work too, because the women who I was around, my mother and my grandmother, they taught me to sew. And they were always telling me that I should do my best and I should do my best at everything I do, which is something that um, you hear a lot from immigrant families nowadays. And you, um, at that time, because of the era that she came from, in order to get ahead and to try your best to outwit segregation and racist ideals, you often had to do more than and work harder than others. And from my undergrad experience, um, I actually had a friend who went to Howard University and I announced to my grandparents and my parents that I wanted to go to Howard. And I remember my grandmother being a little bit upset with that. She said that she thought that I would want to go to the best college that I could. Oh, stop, uh, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I think I just did something. Let me stop sharing this. So you, is, is the other screen able to still pop up? Yeah, okay. So anyway, this is a, a photo of my grandfather in Belgium. 
Um, and I just wanted to point out that, you know, this is the early 30s. And so I'm always thinking, you know, I have to think bigger and I have to do more because my grandfather did more than I did uh, almost 100 years ago. So can we go to the next slide? And these are my mother and her siblings. My mother is the second on the left. They ended up having 10 children. So that's another reason why I feel like I'm really not doing that much, being that I'm a mother of two and not a mother of 10. And can we go to the next slide? These are examples of the work that I did in college, my undergrad experience. I chose Howard because I grew up in New Jersey, a very mixed neighborhood, but I would say maybe about 10% black. And I was looking for African-American culture and influences. Um, just because your neighborhood has black people in it, I think that's a misconception when people feel like, oh, there must be, that must be a very culturally rich neighborhood, but not necessarily. If you live in a neighborhood like I did where there were very forward thinking, very intelligent African-American people, but not everybody was ready to embrace their African heritage. They were, a lot of people were more interested in assimilating and fitting in with the wider American culture, which I put that in quotes because American culture a lot of times just means white culture. And me coming from a family who on one side was from New Orleans and had an international experience and my father being from Ghana, I really wasn't necessarily fitting in with that vibe, not exactly. And I was always looking to Africa because Africa was in me and Howard actually fulfilled that vibe for me. And you see two examples. These are things that I did while I was in class and undergrad. I was already thinking about themes of African women, African-American women. Um, the image on the right, you could see like a huge kind of Barbie face looming in the background. And that was me trying to work out my identity as a black woman. What are the features that I would like to celebrate that may not be celebrated? in the you know, mainstream American culture. And I do wanna say at Howard University, my professors were um, the majority of the painting faculty were members of Afrocobra, the African commune of bad and relevant artists, which was a, a revolutionary black and young group of artists who came out of Chicago on the South side and they basically wrote their own manifesto and became the literal uh, visual leg to the black power movement. So those tenets that black power asserted, like black people should be proud of themselves, black people should be proud of their African heritage, their black hair, their black lips and nose and features, black English should be celebrated. Even our color scheme was our, our color palette was a new color palette. They called it the Kool-Aid palette, which was to throw out the European palette that most art students would use and say, you're not allowed to use white at all to lighten your colors. You had to use yellow, you had to use peach, you had to use orange in order to do so. So that informs my work today. You're still gonna see those themes and you're still gonna see this bright color palette. This is another example of one of my works that I did in undergrad. This is a young lady just walking back and forth in a circle on a little platform. Um, studio classes, I think we had about four hours in the class and you had to do your underpaintings and you'll see here that this is very similar to the colors that I use nowadays, except for now I'm using all fabric. And at the time I was a painting major, I was using acrylic paint. Um, I layered different shades on top of each other. And you'll see the same, these are two pieces that I've worked at most recently. Um, the one on the left side is from The Warmth of Other Suns, which Erica showed earlier. It was a large piece of a family of seven. African-American migration family. And then on the right, that piece is called Daughter of the Dust. I'm still layering colors as I did in my undergrad days. Although it, 
now that I'm looking at it too, I can see myself that I've turned up the volume of the color even more. But when you look at African textiles and you look at Kente and you look at Dutch wax, you're gonna see these similar bright crimsons and burgundies and electric yellows. And the fact that these bright colors are juxtaposed against each other. Um, I often stay with my, my continued interest in portraying African-American people. And that was because I started out with portraying my own family members. And with these two images, they're made about uh, two years apart, maybe two and a half years apart. The image on the left is a detail of a piece called The Princess that is in the exhibit at the Art Institute. And then on the right, that's another family member from the warmth of other sons, one of the sisters. I'm very interested in celebrating African-American hair textures as I did in undergrad, but now I'm using it more in a three-dimensional way. Um, the figure on the right, she has these blue flowers that I, I found off of a piece of silk fabric and cut them and stitched them on because I like the idea of showing that her hair is puffy and it has dimension. I'm also not so interested in showing the difference in complexion in African-Americans as in is a person light skin or are they dark skin? And that, that, that conversation runs very deep in our community. And so I'm deliberately blurring that line. I want it to be obvious that these are black people and that they have black features, but I don't want it to be clear who is necessarily light skin or dark skin. The colors here are shown more for intensity and also to express their mood. If you see red and fuchsia and orange, I'm talking about a warm mood, a sunny disposition. Notice the little girl on the right. She has a slight smile on her face and she's mostly all warm shades. While the little girl on the left, her face is actually divided where she has a warm side, but she also has a very cool side. And because, because I know she was a little girl, now a grown woman on the left, I know that she, as a child had certain struggles and that it wasn't always so warm and sunny for her. And that's why I decided to portray her in that manner. That's a really wonderful introduction, Visa. And I, um, I wanted to kind of um, move uh, forward here and think about um, the conversation between uh, your work and Tanika's. And um, I wanted you kind of both both of you to address uh, the, the way in which photography um, is central to, to your work and how, how did it become central? Um, what, was, what was the impetus for this and, and when did this happen? Yeah, and I'd like to, if Tanika, you should, I'd like to hear your take on that first. And I'm sorry that I didn't get to greet you and say hello earlier, but I'm so happy to be in this conversation with you. And um, I'm really excited to talk. No, thank you, Bisa. I loved your um, introductory answer. You, your answer explained so much of, of how our work speaks to each other because um, I also start my journey, uh, not only with Folded Map Project, but my connection to my neighborhood through my grandmother, um, specifically my maternal grandmother. Um, and just you explaining your use of, of color. And, you know, I'm definitely interested in, in hearing you continue that answer and explain how did photography become central to your work? Well, I think because in undergrad, you know, we always had a model in the classroom and that that's the benefit, you know, the modern century, you can work from a photograph. And our professors always wanted us to work from live people because they move, they have dimension, three dimension. And, the, and working from a, from a photograph is always easier. It's already been flattened out by whatever camera processes. And also the benefit of the photographer's eye, which I'm really interested in. And in you as a photographer, and, and photography in general, the fact that you all can capture a moment where it takes me hours to capture, 
but you have to see that in your mind, I guess I would think in a split second and grab it before it's too late. Yeah, no, um, I appreciate you having um, that deep value of, of photographers and photography because um, it is something that you're you're constantly scanning. Um, you and I are paying attention to the same thing, colors and postures. And, you know, I definitely have to work very quickly in order to capture the, the posture or I have to examine the, the person that I'm photographing for a little bit before I decide to photograph them because I get a sense of what movements they might make. I get a sense of, um, you know, how they might move their head. And then once I'm in tune with that, I can start to figure out in what timing should I capture an image. And, you know, what I also find so fascinating is how similar um, the importance of color is to us, because you were talking about how you punch up the colors and how it's intentional for you to kind of substitute color um, with skin tones. And oftentimes I do the same thing in the editing of my photos. I do very minimal editing. I, I get it all right in the camera. But the one thing that I do uh, edit is the saturation and vibrancy. I've always found myself like scooting the dial up even more because <laughs> I wanted like this photo, I wanted the pink to pop. And even with uh, this moment between the, the parents, I observed them for a minute and I just knew that both of them were going to do uh, settle into a posture, a pose that was going to be perfect on camera. And so I'm, I'm kind of dancing between two answers, giving you, you know, the, the connection between color, between your work and my work, as well as, you know, how us photographers really have to um, pay attention to the people that we want to photograph. We see the, the art and beauty within it. And then, you know, there's the process of capturing the image and then possibly engaging with, with the actual person. And that's a whole other aspect as well. This idea oh. of engagement is really um, interesting and kind of brings me to a, a question I have for Bisa, which is how do you, how do you choose the photos or, you know, the photo that will um, kind of serve as a kind of jumping off point for your work? Like, what is it that engages you in the image? A lot of times I'm scouring through images. Also, this image is just so fantastic of Tanika's. <laughs> you know, you. this image would grab me right away. I'm looking at the beauty of the children, their gazes, how direct they are and how proud they are. But then I also love the individuality. You know, you see the leader out front, you see those children who seem more shy, you see the students who seem more assertive. Well, I'm saying student, my, my teacherness is coming out because I taught for 13 years. <laughs> so when I see kids, I immediately jump to students. But this photo would grab me right away. Um, and then I'm also looking at the composition, how they're like a pyramid with the tall boy in the center. And as it goes out, um, this image that I chose of the four women seated on the steps of Atlanta University, what grabbed me, again, if you look how they're leaning up, they're sort of in a pyramid pose as well. So I'm looking at shapes and I'm also looking at how beautiful they are you know, I'm, I'm attracted to beauty just like anyone else, but I see beauty in everyday people. I mean, these women were not famous. It looked like to me, it may have been a graduation ceremony. And as I looked at the date of the photo, 1899, I get curious. I need to learn more about 1899. What were black people doing in Georgia at that time? Um, I found out that Atlanta College was where the students went for professional degrees. They would have gone to Spelman as undergrads. So not only are these women 
bad as anything, but they are getting graduate degrees even before 1900. Um, I love their confidence, their swagger, their beauty, even the delicacy that they looked good all the way down to their shoes and their slips to the tops of their hats. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at things that grab me and I'm also looking at familiarity. I realized more recently that I'm going back to images that remind me of my own family. And that's what is drawing me in, the Black community. I'm not thinking to myself, I'm only portraying the Black community. But when you create artwork, you do reach inside. And what is inside and around me are my family members and the people who I love and the people who I remember. Mm -hmm. um, this image, Salika Lisevsky, or even this image, um, she was an equestrian in Paris. So she seemed to have some stature, but then this other image of, uh, by Dorothea Lang was a man who maybe didn't seem to have the stature that Salika had. He didn't have the fine clothes. If you um, zoom in, his pants had a patch on them. His hat was torn, his jacket was frayed. But yet and still, there was beauty and dignity in him that I saw. Um, some people asked me, what, how or why do I make people look regal? And I'm thinking, well, he already looked regal. It's mm. just, what glasses are you using when you see this person? Do you feel, you see somebody you feel sorry for, who is poor and an object of pity? Or do you see somebody who looks intelligent, who's peering at you just as you were looking at him, wondering what's up with you. Mm -hmm. And that's what I see. Yeah. Um, I wonder, Tanika, if you could speak a bit about your um, Everyday Rituals series, as well as from your inside, uh, excuse me, from the inside project, because I find a strong resonance between, you know, those, those photographs and Bisa's work. Yeah, no, thank you for that question. Um, even BC using the word, you know, regal, um, that's actually in the description uh, of those two projects. Um, I really wanted, I was really actually tired, especially as a um, freelance photojournalist um, of the depictions of like urban black life is centered on, on dejection and, and um, trauma centered. And I really wanted to do projects that um, celebrated the style, the, the culture, the pride, the beauty. It's like almost like the divinity of everyday black life, the, the experience, uh, the beauty in our you know, regular lives. And those two projects also served a purpose of not only exalting the the, the beauty of everyday black life, even in a neighborhood like Inglewood, but also like tenderly defying the negative depictions of my neighborhood, which has only been talked about in a negative way as it relates to crime and violence. And so, you know, BC, you said something really, you know, beautiful asking the question of, you know, what do you see when you see that image? Do you see the the man posing? Do you see his tattered clothes, or do you see, you know, the the pride and the the regality in his posture? And that's very similar to what I tell people um, about photography: is what you photograph and how you photograph it actually says more about you as the photographer than it does who you're photographing. And so it was very clear in that Andrea Lang photo that um, she saw she saw this this divinity. She saw the um, the resilience and the posture, and that's something that I do in my work. And it was very important for me to show my neighborhood of Inglewood that way, because we have only been viewed so negatively and people talk about this neighborhood in the same way that they have historically talked about black people um just just negatively and trauma centered and so i really wanted to use photography um as a way to kind of exalt the beauty and and the lives the, that we have in our communities they, they they are already kind of like our kingdoms 
you know, even though uh, it's not equitable, uh, we've been disinvested in, uh, but we still find a way to celebrate, to have fun, to have swag, to have style, to love each other. Um, but people don't get to see those images. And a lot of people don't value uh, those images or the details of our lives beyond, um, you know, just the, the barriers that we face. They don't understand it's, it's lives outside of that. It's lives outside of white supremacy. It's lives outside of um, protests. There's actual, you know, uh, interpersonal relationships and it's beautiful. And that's how I really wanted to use my photography to uplift that, that aspect of um, Inglewood, but also in turn, black people in general. Um, I feel like this is a great moment, this discussion of beauty and kind of everyday images to think about Gordon Parks. And I know you both talked a little bit about, um, uh, to me, about the impact of Gordon Parks. And I, I wonder if you might um, share a little bit about, you know, how he has informed and shaped your practices and really the role of everyday images for both of you. Wow. <laughs> It's a small question. <laughs> I know it's for me as a photographer. Uh, you know, sometimes you get called to a medium and you don't understand why. You might have had a relative that practiced a medium, or you just, you know, gravitate to a medium. And I gravitated to photography. And you know, most photographers, you see the images in your in your mind, like. I've often joked like if I had a camera in my eyeball that would be best because I could literally blink every time I see because I, I see in photos and so when I saw Gordon Parks when I learned of his work two things happened I was like he sees black people like I see them I see the art like I is so many pictures that he's taken that I'm like yes I would have taken that same picture or I would have knelt down like and I just immediately felt connected to his work because I was viewing um, my neighborhood and my friends the same way. And so seeing his work and being introduced to his work gave me the validation that, okay, yes, no, I, I'm, I'm seeing exactly what this amazing photographer was seeing, but I'm seeing it in contemporary times. And um, it gave me um, confidence to know that um, this was beautiful. This was art. This was important to document. And he gave me, his work gave me a confidence that I didn't necessarily, um, and validation that I didn't necessarily get um, in college. Because I, unlike Bisa, I went to, you know, Columbia College in the late 90s. And in the photography department, I was oftentimes the only Black person, definitely the only person <laughs> documenting Black people from Inglewood. <laughs> and so I didn't really get a sense of validation, like this is worth documenting until I was introduced to Gordon Park's work and the work of Roy de Carava. Yeah, I, I, I feel so much in line with what you're saying, that validation. You know, I'm always looking at our elders and the road that they left for us, you know. I did have um, my professors at Howard, thank God, you know, because it's so rough, undergrad already, you're especially a student of the arts and being a black person, most people are telling you that you can't live like that, you can't survive, you're gonna be a starving artist. So we need all the support that we get. Not that all of my professors were supporting, <laughs> not, not all of them, especially because I started adding fabric in my pieces. I was gluing things like Lemire Bearden, mm. but Gordon Parks, like you said, when I saw his work, I also felt like this familiarity and I saw the beauty in which he portrayed his subject manners, his subjects, excuse me, and that he was one who got to know his subjects or he already knew them a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And I like the way he said he wanted to set the record straight. 
you know, there's something to be said about those of us who see the view from within. Mm -hmm. You're not a part of the community. Um, you can try to ingratiate yourself to the community, which like you mentioned, like Dorothea Lang, she did do that. But Roy de Carver, I think I read that he moved to Puerto Rico and surrounded himself with the community. And I wouldn't say that everybody has to dig in like that, but it makes a difference mm -hmm. how you are seeing things mm -hmm. from the inside out. And that perspective is gonna be very different when you are one of those people as opposed to somebody else. Mm -hmm. From the inside, we have love, we have family. This, this picture that's on the screen now, the mother and child, and we, we discussed that a little bit earlier, how much, how much that familiarity between the mother and child, although these photos are about, I think, 60 or 70 years apart, um, mm -hmm. there are things that are universal that I think that people need to see in our work. They mm -hmm. see the, that Black love is real and motherhood and protectiveness and even a, a petulant little child. But they can also see that humanity mm -hmm. transcends race mm -hmm. and we are portraying human beings. Yes. And I hope that when other people see that, they realize that maybe if they don't know any black people, maybe mm -hmm. for a moment it starts to come through they're people just like me yeah. and they have the same vulnerabilities just like me. Yeah, and I think it's so beautiful about um, you substituting color for skin tones to kind of transcend that issue of, you know, light skin, dark skin, um, because that's very similar in, uh, you know, focusing on portraits and the postures and, and the emotions of a, of an image because that ultimately transcends race. And it makes me think about this quote um, that I heard Lorraine Hansberry say in a documentary um, where she said, the more specific a story, the more universe, the more universal it is. And oh. you basically just said that, you know, and it's, it's true when you focus on the, the nuances and the, the intricacies of personalities and people that transcends race, it transcends, you know, cultural differences because you're getting at the core. And I just, I think that's, that's, that's beautiful. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And I just want to note the similarities in case other people <laughs> aren't seeing what I'm seeing. I mean, <laughs> the mother is so coiffed down to everything and she's making sure her child looks just as good as she does and both of them. And, and the mother as this protective figure is something that's so central in our community. And it, it, it happened before and it will continue. Yeah. Um, I just want to pop in really quickly to say that we have uh, a question from um, a fellow artist and hometown hero, Amanda Williams. Ah, um, Amanda. <laughs> and um, she writes, Tanika and Bisa's worth both bring us the inherent dignity of images of the everyday for Black subjects. Can you all talk about the difference between Tanika needing to situate her subjects in sometimes less than ideal backgrounds, spatial contexts, um, versus Bisa's ability to select and control the imagined or fantastical idealized backgrounds she creates via textile choices? Such an Amanda question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. I'll let you kick that off. <laughs> I just think, it, you know, I didn't realize that's, that's another thing, the beauty of photography. I didn't, it didn't dawn on me that you moved your subjects mm -hmm. from where they were. Whereas mine, well, I, I started deleting their backgrounds because I was so interested in the human aspect that I didn't want anything to shake that. Mm. And I didn't want it to be time or space. 
that made people start making other different judgments about them. When what I'm focused on is the people themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I almost felt like my background is like a set, you know, and then I get to decide how to support this cast of characters. Mm -hmm. and, and for this one in particular, the children in the safety patrol, they were kids who were walking home from school and the patrol officer is there stopping the rest. So they have to wait until he says it's safe to pass. But we've already, I felt also was like, sort of like a Bauhaus thing. You already know where they are. They've got to be on a curve somewhere. And I felt like that was enough. But I liked putting them in this natural environment too, where it almost looks like those little wish flowers that we had when we were little, just to reinforce the idea that these are children just like everyone else. The fact that they need a crossing guard is gonna let you know there's most likely an urban environment, mm -hmm. but they still ha have to exist as natural beings and they're still just little children. No, I love that answer because, you know, mine um, is, is, is specifically planted in, you know, the exact neighborhood in, in in which they are. And it's important for me to show that contrast, you know, because some of the neighborhoods, you know, or backgrounds might not be um, uh, beautiful, so to speak, uh, or aesthetically pleasing. But yet and still, and in spite of, there is this swag or regalness or, you know, focus or, um, in a posture or body gesture or pose that I believe stands out even more against the backdrop of divestment or neighborhoods that that have clearly uh, have been structurally or systemically um, disinvested in. And so it leads people to focus on kind of like the confidence or resilience you know, having that contrast between that kind of background and how like even this little girl, that's Inglewood, but she is doing her homework in the park. The park that people would just assume, oh my gosh, you can't go there, you're going to get shot. But look at her, she's focused mm -hmm. <laughs> and she's, at a park in Inglewood that probably has some broken, you know, swings, but that doesn't matter. That that doesn't impact her. <laughs> so I definitely um, think that's critical to, to to me situating my subjects in their actual, you know, neighborhood. That's so wonderful to hear and really so wonderful to have such a rich question from Amanda. Um, I have uh, another question for you too um, regarding um, both of your kind of mentioned your inspiration of your grandmothers and um, this audience member um, is wondering if you can speak to the role of ancestral knowledge um, in shaping your work and the larger modern black arts canon. So just a big question. <laughs> That's a smart question. Do you want to we want to answer that, Tanika? Um, you can go. I want to hear your answer so bad. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, what I learned from my grandmother, she wasn't a quilter. Um, my mother wasn't a quilter. And we know that there's a long African American tradition of quilting. So it is possible that I had ancestors who did quilt maybe even on plantations, but those records would not have been kept and at least not that, not to my knowledge. And my father's side of the family is from Ghana and they're famous for their kente weavings. Um, kente also is primarily woven by men. So mm -hmm. that could be in my ancestry as well. And then I'm also using like the technique. If you look at this piece of the safety patrol, it's called applique. An applique just means that you're applying fabric on top of another fabric. Quilting is just a process of actually stitching that through three layers where you have a top and like a cotton batting and then the background, which is make it like a sandwich. So that stitching process is the quilting, but applique, that layering, 
um, the style that I use creating figures is something that is also done in Benin, where my ancestors come from. Um, my name, Bisa, in, uh, in my homeland, Bisa means those who came from the clouds. Mm -hmm. And my ancestors traveled from Mali and Benin from the mountains and then walked down into Northern Ghana and to the people there, it looked like they came out of the clouds. Mm -hmm. So I feel like my name was an ancestral legacy that maybe it was genetic. I don't know. Um, I wasn't named that for, my sister couldn't say Melissa. A lot of people don't know my full name is actually Melissa. And my family used to say baby Melissa. And she, my sister Suki used to say, Babisa, Babisa, and that turned into Bisa. So I feel like that name came from the clouds, you know, from my ancestors and the skill. Um, the only thing I could say that I definitely got from my grandmother was that meticulous design. My grandmother made three piece suits. She made a winter coat with a fur collar. My mother made all sorts of linen dresses and they were always copying like Christian Dior dresses out of Vogue magazines and copy them and, and make them. Um, and so I learned that craftsmanship from them and being really particular. And the fabric that I use to create the figures, a lot of their faces and bodies are made from dressmakers fabric using silk and wool and lace. And originally I wasn't thinking that I wanted to make these figures out of expensive fabrics. The thing was I was in college and I couldn't afford to buy my own fabric. So I asked them for their cast off fabrics or their remnants, which were all those dressmakers fabrics, the silk and the wool and the brocade and the jacquard. So I started quilting right away using fabrics that at the time, this was like early 2000s, a lot of people would tell me that those are not proper quilt fabrics, but um. I found that most of the quilters though were very accepting and welcoming and actually the African-American quilters were always um, giving me advice and telling me that, helping me with my skill, but then also telling me that they liked that I came from outside of the quilting community. Mm. Yeah, no, my, my grandmothers, um, funny enough, both of my grandmothers, my maternal and paternal grandmothers have the same name. How insane is that? So I feel like that's yeah. in order. They're both named Marilyn. <laughs> oh, how beautiful. Yes, I know. And um, I would say, uh, you know, my, my maternal grandmother, who I just had such a close relationship with, um, she, she was an artist you know, and she, you know, cultivated a family of artists. My mom's a writer, she's a, she's an artist. My two uncles who are like my brothers, they're painters. My grandmother was a painter and a wow. singer. So I feel the ancestral knowledge comes from um, the lineage of women that my maternal grandmother came from that understood how to cultivate uh, the freedom of a, a, young, a young artist, you know, because how would you learn to do that? You know, my, my grandmother growing up in a racist segregated world, still figuring out how to prioritize art. Like that's some ancestral stuff to know. It's still important. I don't care if I have to shift my life and not even focus on my art in order to survive. I am still going to uplift art in my household, because I know that it's a priority. So for me, that's where like ancestral knowledge comes from because there is no reason that my grandmother and my mother, I told them that I wanted to play the piano and I was serious about piano lessons. And after a few years, they bought me a piano. They felt like, who does that? That's <laughs> That to me um, is beyond just the purchase of a piano. It was, you know, them letting me know what you want to do, this pursuit, this uh, artistic interest is of value and of importance enough for us to invest in this way. And so I feel like um, that speaks so true to the ancestral knowledge that, that I feel of being guided of a, of, of a lineage of, of possibly artists, you know, um, unfortunately, I don't know 
my family beyond a certain point. Um, but we could come from just, you know, a whole tribe of artists because there, okay. there is absolutely no way that, you know, I've rationalized this, like all of the artistic endeavors that I've had and they have supported it all. My mom, my grandmother, even my uncles, like, you know, and, and so that's what I feel has given me the, the confidence to, to know that documenting our perspective and our lives is critical. Um, and there, and it was something that uh, innately, that I innately demonstrated. And so I definitely feel connected to um, ancestors uh, because of that of knowing that it is a priority to um, document our lived experience from the inside. Yes. What a very lovely way to um, end this conversation. Thank you um, so much, Isa and Tanika for joining us and really allowing me to share in this conversation a little bit with you. Um, thank you to everyone who has joined us virtually. We are delighted um, to have had you come along with us on this journey. Um, and please um, feel free to uh, visit uh, the exhibition Visa Butler Portraits online at arctic.edu. And you can look for more information um, in your email as well. And um, with that, I'll just say, we hope to see you again soon and appreciate you so much, but especially thank you to Bisa and Tanika one last time. Oh, thank, thank you, Erica. Thank you, Tanika. I had a ball chatting. Oh, I love this so much. It was so wonderful getting to know you and about your work more personally through you. And thank you, Erica, for the wonderful questions. Yes, and thank you all for coming and joining us today. I appreciate it. Yes, all 400, close to 500 <laughs> of you all. Thank you. <laughs>